you got your Bibles, uh, I'll have you turn right now to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5 in the New Testament. So while you're doing that, I want to point out something. In your notes there, uh, you'll see two key passages, Romans 14, the first 19 verses, and then in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through <clears throat> verse 14. Uh, we'll touch on those, but I want I put those in there for your reading's sake to guide your um, uh, devotional reading this week. So we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians in a couple of minutes. Our series this month, uh, during the month of May, is called One Another. The series deals with the family rules that we all live by. All of us in our homes uh, have certain guidelines, certain rules, whether they're written or not, they're, whether they're enforced or not, we all have rules whereby we attempt to live together, where we attempt to play together and play nice and get along. Without rules, without guidelines, in any social organization, we're going to have chaos. Even in a church, we have guidelines, we have family rules that God himself has instituted. And that's what we're talking about during this series. One another applies to all of those things in Scripture where God makes statements about us uh, as Christians and how we're to get along with one another. So while you're in 1 Thessalonians, I'm going to read a couple of passages to you. And the first one I'm going to read is from Hebrews chapter 2, reading a bit of first, uh, or, excuse me here, Hebrews 2, uh, verse 10 and 11. A little bit of verse 10, moving on to verse 11. I'm going to read to you from the New International Version. I'll be using uh, several versions of Scripture today just to help all the people in our church that may be using one type of Bible or another. So Hebrews 2, verse 10 through 11, I'll read this to you. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy, are of the same family. The key thought there is the word family. Then it goes on and says, So Jesus is not ashamed to call them, those people who God has brought together, he is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. So in Scripture, it uses family terminology, words that you and I can relate to. And it says here that when God saves somebody, he makes them holy. It brings them into a family. And within this family called the church, we have brothers, we have sisters. Now, with that in mind, we, we would go a few books to the right uh, towards the end of the Bible. And we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and the first part of verse 3. 1 Peter 1 verse 3. And I'm going to read to you now from the Living Bible, just a different version, different way to hear God's Word. It says this, All honor to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Jesus Christ has a Father. That's God. <clears throat> we know that Jesus himself in nature is God, but he has a role. He has a, a different role than the Father. But yet, within their relationship, he acknowledges him as dad. In fact, he called him daddy by the use of the word Abba in Scripture. All honor to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it is his boundless mercy that has given us the privilege of being born again. So that uh, now we are all members of God's own family. In both Hebrews and in 1 Peter 1, it uses the word family. And it talks about the church being together in a relationship that God recognizes as family. It doesn't say that the church is like a family. It doesn't say that. It says it is a family. And you and I in America, we have gotten away from this. We think that the church is an organization. We think it's something that we can attend when we have time, when we don't have anything else on our uh, to-do list. But that's not the way we live in our normal families. And Scripture says the church is a family. We're, we're to treat the church as a family. And within a family, we have certain rules, we have certain expectations, certain guidelines that, that govern how we treat one another. By looking at those passages in Hebrews in 1 Peter 1, what we learn is this. God is literally our Father. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray to God. And he says, when you pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven. He didn't say, My Father, None of us can really call God my father. He is our father because we're part of a family. It goes on in these passages, we learn that Jesus is our brother. Our, we could liken him unto an elder brother. And then the scripture says that we are all brothers and sisters together. 
we have an order, a social order to the church. God doesn't say we're an organization. We're an organism. We are alive. We're a family. And he is the one over our family. As a result of that, we are to treat each other according to his rules, his guidelines. Now, how did we become part of the family? And this is where if you read the Ephesians passage in chapter 1 that is in your notes, you will see something that's a little bit different for most of us. Most of us have been born into a family, but yet we do know people that have been adopted. In our church here, we have people that have been adopted by another family. We have people in our church who have adopted children into their family. James and Nikki Berry are a good example of that. They've just added to the berry patch, if you will. They've added a couple little boys into their family. Now, I want you to think about this idea of adoption because the scripture points us out. And we have to understand adoption, not in light of American culture today, but in light of the Roman culture as it existed back in the first century. <clears throat> when we are adopted, people adopt us. Think about that. When we, if we're adopted, it means somebody else has adopted us. You don't adopt the parents. The parents adopt you. If the adoptive parents, if their last name is Smith, you are now part of the Smith family. That becomes your last name. Uh, you have your dinner with the parents, and if there are other children, with your siblings. They now become your sibling. You're part of their family. You've been added to it. You may share a bedroom. I shared a bedroom with my brother for many years. You sh as a Smith, you now share living space with that family. If you are a Smith, you share it with the Smith siblings. When you go to school, a teacher calls roll call, and when they come to the name Smith, you raise your hand. It's the same name that your maybe older siblings and younger siblings will raise, have raised their hands or will raise their hands to. It's the idea of adoption. You become part of something else because they initiate it, not you. And what we learn here in Ephesians chapter 1 is God is the initiator. God is the parent. He comes to us. He loves us so much. He adopts us, saves us from our sin, and adds us into his family. <clears throat> it wasn't your decision. An adopted child didn't make the decision to go with a particular family. The family makes the decision to add that child to them. And we have to understand that. On that day, you become the child of someone else. Perhaps your birth parents had died, or perhaps they gave you up for adoption for a multitude of reasons. But on that day of adoption, you now legally are part of another family. Now, in the Christian sense, in the church, our name's not necessarily Smith, but it's Christian. We are adopted through Jesus Christ. We bear his name. We take on his name. That's what the name Christian means. It means we're part of a family. And when you're part of a family, there are certain attitudes. There are certain behaviors that are expected. They're required in order for that family to get along. We at Grace talk about playing nice. So we, if we're going to get along within our church context or any church context, we have to understand what the parent, our Father in heaven, has asked us to do. And he's listed these in terms of the phrase, one another. There's over 100 statements in the New Testament that talk about one another. Love one another, forgive one another, uh, encourage one another. All of that means this is how we are to live. And it's impossible to think that we can get along in a church or in any family and not live by the guidelines. The guidelines are for our benefit and for the benefit of all. Guidelines are never there uh, to beat you down. They're to help you and lift you up so that we can all have the best possible life. As a church, we have to understand the one another's. And it's not enough to intellectually know what the rule says. We have to abide by it if we're going to get along. Now, there are people in our culture, there are people in a family who choose to be dysfunctional. Now, I'm not talking about a medical reason here. 
they choose, willfully choose to be dysfunctional. They know the rules, they know the guidelines, and they say to heck with it. There are those people and families that choose to live in isolation, others in outright rebellion. As a result of that, the entire family, the entire social network breaks down. A person who cares about family will seek to live out the one another's. They don't casually throw them aside, but they say, if this is what my Heavenly Father expects of me, if this is what will benefit everyone, then I will live by these rules. So that's what we're looking at in our series, things that are uh, referred to in Scripture as the one another's. Last week when we began the series, we looked at the very first one another that's given in the New Testament. Jesus said to love one another. In fact, he makes that an outright command. If we love one another, as we talked about it last week, and love is simply a committed action of sacrifice on the behalf of another person or a group of people, a committed sacrifice on their behalf, regardless of circumstances, regardless of how they respond, if we love, love one another, all the rest of the one another's will be fulfilled. And this is why over and over and over the command to love one another, love each other, is given in Scripture. It's because of our nature, we tend to be a little rebellious. We tend to be selfish. We live on the sinful edge. In media, our, our, I guess our entertainment industry, we would say we tend to walk on the dark side. We are told to love one another because it's all-encompassing of everything else that God expects of us. And we know ourselves as parents that you have to tell your children over and over and over the simplest things. We have to bend their will so that they will become productive members of the family, but also of our uh, culture and our society. You cannot just be told something once and think that it's going to take place. That's why scripture repeatedly says to love one another. It's all encompassing on our life. Now, how do you make this practical? I, I, I came across a sign this week that I really like. As we're teaching, the, uh, last week we looked at five love languages, five different ways of expressing love, and I came across this sign. Hopefully you can see it on the screen, but it's five love languages in a practical way, and it uses the idea of a taco. Now think about that. We said there's words of a affirmation. So here's what you could say. Your tacos are delicious. See, that's a way of expressing love and concern for somebody. An act of service. I made you tacos. It's something you do for somebody. It's something you give them. Then there are um, the idea of receiving gifts. When somebody might say, thank you for the taco. Here, here is a taco for you. And it's a gift that's given to you. Wouldn't you love it to go into a, a Mexican restaurant and have somebody come up and say, I just love you being here as, a, as a, one of my customers today. Here's a taco for you free. Another way, quality time. You look at somebody and say, hey, you want to go out together for tacos? And the last one is physical touch. Let me hold you like a taco. Now that's stupid, you might say that's stupid, but it gets across the five love languages. Words of affirmation, acts of service, um, receiving gifts or giving gifts, quality time, and then physical touch. We looked at the first and the most important love language last week, and that was simply our words, the way that you and I communicate one with another. Then on um, Wednesday of this past week, I simply looked at Mark chapter one, and I took the idea of expressing love, helping others to know that they're loved. We looked at the life of Christ in Mark chapter one, where he interacts with a single leper. And Jesus used multiple ways to express his appreciation, his concern, his approval, his acceptance of that one leper. If we're gonna get along in the church, get along in our families, we have to practice those five love languages. Today we're gonna to look at another one another. Love one another is critical. Now you're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 11. Paul is writing this, the Apostle Paul is writing this. <clears throat> and this is a, another one another in Scripture. There's many of them, and I have just simply have chosen this one to speak about today. Therefore, encourage one another. Now I'm reading from the New International Version. 
the idea of encouragement, but then it goes on, and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. What we're looking at is really the two of these things combined, the idea of encouraging and the idea of building one another up. In the King James Version, it uses the phrase edify one another. Edify one another. Now, who uses that word today? That's 1611 English. But edify means to build up, to construct something. In the um, English Standard Version, it says build one another up in this passage. So it's whether we talk about edify, build each other up, or build one another up, that's the message for today. I uh, came across a picture here. And it's the idea of taking blocks of wood and stacking them. And I know there's, uh, there's games that use this format where you put, uh, think of a little piece of a two by four cut uh, and have a gazillion of those and you start stacking them. And you, get, you see who can stack at the highest without this falling over. Or once it's built, then you start removing them and see who can destroy, or you try to not to be the person who's going to make it come down or destroy it. With that in mind, there's two kinds of people that it's been said in this world. Those who build and those who destroy. Now let me ask you, which is the easiest of those to do? Which takes the least amount of effort, the least amount of planning, the least amount of concern? To build or to destroy? Think of relationships. How many years have you put into building a relationship with a family member, with a friend, coworker, classmate, and how quickly can that be destroyed? When we think about building each other up, it requires work, it requires strategy, it requires great persistence. It doesn't take a lot of effort to tear somebody down, but it requires thought and diligence strategy, patience, and commitment to build somebody up, and it's a long-term investment. You can destroy a person quickly. You can destroy a building quickly, but to put it there in the first place, it requires lots of effort, and the scripture says we're to build each other up in the church, in our family, in our communities, nation, build each other. Up. That's the be, to be the direction and the heartbeat of our life. I think any parent, I, I've met what I would call a few bad parents in my life. I think the vast majority of parents attempt to build their family up. They intend to build something that will be dynamic, something that will be good, something that will be positive. And they try to build even what we would call a decent family. God's no different. God wants the best for all of those. Why do we, why do we build into our children? Because we love them and we want the best for them. God does the exact same thing for us. And we know as parents that when somebody attempts to destroy a family or a, a church or a community, the social networking and fabric of that group, it sickens us. It can anger us. It can tick us off, if you will. And God's no different. God made all people in his image. And I think it really, really bothers him if we take our family structure, our church structure, and we're cavalier about it. We just have a whatever attitude. God has put a lot of effort into not only creating us and creating us differently, but in using the circumstances of life to bring all of us, particularly in a church setting, into one group. God really cares about his church, and he wants us to treat it in a precious manner. He doesn't like it if we mistreat one another, or if we misuse one another, or if we misjudge one another. And we've got to understand this. It's his church, not your church, not mine. These are his people. And we've got to play nice for his sake because these people matter to him. So I want you to think of a toolbox now. You go into just about any home in America, either into their basement, into their garage, or into their shed, you're going to see a set of tools some are much more elaborate than others. Some are well-kept. Some are very clean. Others are grungy as can be, and they're tossed wherever. But they're tools. And tools can be used to build things. Tools can be used to destroy things. And I want you to think today just about our um, uh, family structure and our church structure. What are the tools that will help us 
to build one another up, to become the people that God wants us to be. So I'm just going to suggest to you six different tools. If you can think of a toolbox, two of different tools, They're, they can all be used together. Any one of them can be used alone. And there are ways that we're, whereby you and I could build into our family structure, build into our church, build into our schools, workplaces, uh, sports teams, etc. The first we talked about uh, last week, spent most of last week on this one, and it's because it's important. And that is our speech, our speech. So if you should have a line there, if you've got your notes printed off, and you could write down our speech. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, I believe we closed the service out last week with this passage. Reading from the NIV, it says, Do not, now remember, that's a choice. You can or you can't. It says, do not, it, and God is telling us, don't do this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others Catch that? Building others up according to their needs. There's The way we talk should be taken and used in such a way that we consider the other person and we ask ourselves, what do they need to hear? What would be the most beneficial? I'm not talking about flattering people. Sometimes you have to get a good kick in the rear sometimes to move from where you are to where God wants you to be. But we need to use our speech in such a way it builds people up according to their needs. Some people need to be affirmed. Some people just need to be approved. Some people need to be challenged. Some people need to be corrected. It says, for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, I love that, those who listen. And as parents, we've all done this. We try to give some good input into a child's life, and they don't what? They don't listen, they, and for a lot of reasons. They think, generally, it's they think they know everything already. So you could give the very best wisdom to one child who's a stubborn head, and they will not hear it, and they'll make a train wreck out of their life and out of the family situation and everything they touch. And those kids who are wanting to reach their potentials, who are wanting to um, honor God, who want to work together with others, they'll listen and it will benefit them and they'll become a benefit to others. Now, as I thought through words this week, you got five digits on a hand. You could trace your hand if you want and write one for each of these. You could use a five-pointed star, however you want to do this, number one through five. Our words, some of this is wisdom from my mother. Our words, number one, need to be truthful. All of us can grow in that area. Truthful. That will benefit people. That will make us a better person and make our churches and families better if we're truthful. Number two, thoughtful. That before we say something, we ask ourselves, is this going to benefit this person or is it going to hurt this person? Is it going to build them up or tear them down? Thoughtful. What do they need now to hear? They don't need to hear everything that you know. They need right now this particular truth. What would it be? So truthful, thoughtful. Third is timely. That's an important ingredient. There are certain times when people are receptive to hearing a word of wisdom from you. And we need to watch our mouths. And someone has said we have two ears and one mouth because God wants to spend twice as much time listening. Our words need to be timely based upon what we're hearing. Fourth is tasteful. Not bitter, not harsh, but sweet. And the scripture actually uses that illustration that our words have to be sweet like honeycomb, if you will. Tasteful. Uh, nobody likes to be around a negative person and nobody likes negativity all of the time. Constructive, yes, but not negative. So truthful, thoughtful, timely, tasteful, and here's the last one, transformative. Our words should have a goal to them, not just to spout off, but to transform a person. And this is what many parents need to learn, is sometimes we just say things, and the things we say are harsh, because all we're trying to do is vent. It's like verbal puking upon somebody. And our words have to be have more substance to that. We have to think of where a person is. Where do we want them to be for God's sake and for 
the sake of others, not just to prove your point. Transformative means that you have an end in goal or an end in mind and have a goal that you're shooting towards. Somebody has written these words and they said, be careful with your words. Once they are said, they can only be forgiven, not forgotten. Let that thought guide you. Someone else has said, simple words, kind or unkind, can change someone's entire day, even their eternity. And I always, when I hear a phrase like that, I always go back to the biblical story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. As Jesus is passing underneath the tree, uh, Zacchaeus has climbed up. He's looking to see Jesus, maybe even hear something he says, and Jesus tells him, you come down, I need to spend time with you today. It totally changed his life. Simple words can change a person. They can build them up, but they could also destroy them. Second tool that we might have in our toolbox to use in somebody's life is our personal example. And I'm going to read to you in Romans chapter 14. Uh, you could look at that verse 13 through 21. And I'm going to just read two of those verses, verse 13 and 19 from the New Living Translation. Our example. Most of us, our moms were a positive role model. When we reflect upon our mom, we think of her example. Sometimes that example is hilarious. Other times it's thoughtful. Other times it brings us to tears. And because she was a human being, sometimes there's things that make us grind our teeth. But our example is a great way to build other people up. It says in verse 13, so let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Goes on in verse 19, so then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. You see, that should be our purpose. When we come to church, when we walk in the doors of our uh, spiritual family on Sunday morning, it's not it's, our motive should not be, what can I get from somebody? It should be, what can I give to others? How can I bless people? How can I pray for people? How can I encourage them? How can I let them know they're cared for? That changes the dynamic of any social group. You and I, oftentimes, when we think of our example, we try to impose on others our beliefs, our standards, our guidelines, and our words. We try to make people like us, think like us, and that causes nothing but conflict. We have to always remember this saying. I heard this probably in grade school the first time I heard it. More is caught than is, say it, more is caught than is taught. Children watch us. Our spouse watches us. Coworkers watch us. People in the community watch us. We can improve in this area of being a role model. Not a better church member, but a better Christian. Somebody who represents Christ to them. Because there's greater likelihood of influencing them through our example than there is through our, just our words. Both are needed. Notice, the first tool was our speech, how we talk. If all we do is say things the way that we think people should live, but our lifestyle doesn't back us up, it's forgotten. They'll blow us off. Both are critical. The idea of example, we can live like Jesus, but if we have never talk to them like Jesus, we're just another good person. Both tools of our speech and our example go hand in hand. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 from the New Living Translation the Apostle Paul talks about the importance of being a good role model, the influence that can bring into uh, our relationships, into our social gatherings. He says there in Philippians 3.17, again, New Living Translation, Dear brothers and sisters, notice the family verbiage there. That's the way he viewed his church. Not members, not attenders, not even belongers. Dear brothers and sisters, Pattern your lives after mine. Now that takes some guts and that takes some commitment to be able to look at somebody else and say, live like me and learn from those who follow our example. The power of example has been used throughout history. 
to influence people to reach their potential, but also to create movements that have really benefited our world. If you think of Mother Teresa, you think of Mahatma Gandhi, two people who influence literally hundreds of millions of people around the world, primarily through their example. Here's a third uh, tool or set of tools within our toolbox of how to encourage, how to build people up. Number three is our gifts, that's your first blank, our talents, and third blank would be our abilities, our gifts, talents, and abilities. Now, if you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the whole chapter is all about the fact that the church, all of us individuals within the church, we've been meshed together by the Spirit of God, and then each of us have been given spiritual gifts, and we know we all have uh, talents and abilities. Some of those are learned, some of those are natural, but spiritual gifts are given to us by God. Now, using the English Standard Version, the ESV, very popular Bible, let me read just two of those verses to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'm going to read to you verse 12. I'm going to read the latter part of verse 26. Listen to what it says about our gifts, talents, and abilities. It says, so with yourselves in verse 12, since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit or manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. The reason we have spiritual gifts, the reason we have talents and abilities is to build up other people. Now, with your talents and your abilities, you can work in your community, your school, your workplace, and make it a much better place. But spiritual gifts are combined with those uh, natural talents and abilities. Spiritual gifts are combined with them within the church to build us up to become all that God wants us to be. In verse 26, the latter part of verse 26, it says this. I'll let you look there for a second. It says, let all things be done for building up. That's the reason we do church. That's the reason we come, to build one another up. By definition, a tool is an object that is used to extend the ability of an individual to modify features of the surrounding environment. Now, that's a technical term, but think of a hammer. Okay, you've got a, an arm, it's an extension of your arm, it's an extension of your physical strength to impact the environment around you. And again, a hammer can be used to build up, hammer can be used to destroy. God never asked the church to be a beautiful showcase of tools. Now, I've been in some guys' garages where you walk in and it's it is like... Um, a Sears Craftsman display. Every tool known to man, all in their perfect spot, and they have 150 wrenches, 20 different hammers, etc. You all know people like that. That's not what the church is supposed to be, it's a collection of perfect people. Good tools are used often. They're dirty, they get messy. Uh, tools are used in a flurry of activity, always purposeful and highly constructive. Church can be messy. Within a church, you have some well-used tools, people who have poured their guts into making that a spiritual environment, trying to impact their surrounding community. Each of us have spiritual gifts. Each of us are a tool. God wants us to make our churches, our families, our communities the best places that they can be. And we've heard this old saying, either you use it or you, you lose it. And it's the same thing with a spiritual gift. Same thing with your natural ability and your natural talents. Now, all of us that have aged, if you're over 35 or 40, you know what I'm talking about. Remember when you could stay up all night, sleep a couple hours, get up, and you were ready to go? How's that working for you in your 40s, 50s, and 60s? Your energy level drops. Your muscle tone drops. Your memory <laughs> has dropped somewhere. How many of us have ever walked into a room to get something and we're intent, we're purposeful, we're walking fast. You get into the middle of the room and you go, what am I doing here? You've totally forgotten it. If you don't use the gifts, talents, and abilities God's given you, you have a very short period of time 
where you're sharp, where you're physically um, um, empowered. All of that tends just through attrition, through physical attrition, you begin to lose that. And within a church, we have tools, people. They're only here with us a short period of time. We need to appreciate them. But more importantly, we need to, each of us, use the gifts, talents, and abilities that we have to benefit others because they're not always going to be here. We're not always going to be here. And I'd hate to stand in front of the Lord and have him with a toolbox there with a screwdriver or a hammer, and he says, you know, I gave you a gift. I gave you a tool to use in your church, in your school. I gave you a natural talent to use to benefit others. And as Jesus holds that tool and he looks at you and he says, tell me what you did with that. Sad thing, some of us wouldn't even know what he's talking about because we're sitters. We come to a church, we belong to a family, but we rarely contribute anything positive. We need to use our lives. If we don't use those gifts, our life will soon be, o be over. Our time frame to be able to use that gift will have expired. A fourth gift fourth tool, if you will, in our toolbox, number four is our humility and empathy. Our humility and our empathy. In 1 Corinthians 8, looking at the Living Bible, 1 Corinthians 8, in the Living Bible, it's the first version of the Bible I really read because it was in everyday language that I could understand. The writer says, next is your question about eating food that has been sacrificed to idols. In the early church, there was a lot of uh, uh, discussion and a lot of bickering back and forth because people had come out of being an idol worshiper into the church, but yet when they go, would go back into the market, back into Myers, back at the Carl's, back at the uh, Walmart, wherever they were going to get their food in those days, the an animal may have been killed and sacrificed to an idol, and then they sold the meat in the market. And they would go back and they would buy, a, you know, a pound of hamburger from a, a cow that had been sacrificed. So people would argue about this. Should we eat this? Should we not eat this? It goes on in the verse and it says, on this question, everyone feels that only his answer is the right one. Have you noticed in our culture today that people are very opinionated? They believe only one thing and they're not, they're closed minded. They will not accept anything else. That could creep into a church. It says the, they feel only their answer is the right one. But although being a know it all makes us feel important, Paul writes, what is really needed to build the church is love. People really matter. Now, I don't know who showed this to me, but they used their finger once and they started poking me. And they say a lot of people like to prove their point. And when you get done proving your point, both of you are sore. One at the tip of their finger, the other the area where they've been poking. And when you get done, all you've done is aggravate another person. And they, what they said is this. You need to remember people are more important than your point. Now, I like this statement. When you talk about the idea that we need to... Uh, use our humility and our empathy and, and be more considerate of other people. Someone wrote these words. We need to get off our high horse more and ride on the other person's horse to understand the nature of their saddle sores. I like that. Sometimes we're on a horse, we're criticizing somebody else and why they do something but we've never sat on their horse. We've never been in their life. We've never spent any time getting to know them in their life circumstance. So we don't appreciate where they're coming from. Very important way to encourage and build up each other is just be more understanding. Fifth, very obvious, King James Version, Jude chapter 1, verse 20, is our prayers. Our prayers. It says in verse 20, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, that's the King James Version. It simply is telling us this. Prayer is critical. Prayer is absolutely critical to building other people up, encouraging them, seeing them be, reach their utmost potential for the Lord. Now, 
as a coach, I've used this statement many a time. Many of you have heard this in one capacity or another. A team is only as strong as what? Uh -huh. Our weakest link. What we have to consider is this. I don't want you to be the weakest link. And I don't want to be the weakest link in your life, in our church. The best way to help somebody grow strong spiritually, to build ourselves up, is through prayer, it says. Prayer is absolutely critical to avoid being a weak link that can hinder our family, our church, etc. One of the things that uh, I had a pleasure, a lot of pleasure doing this week was taking out little bags of goodies for some of the mothers in the church, as all of our staff did, and spending time in prayer for some of the people that we were able to physically give those gifts to. Either pray for them as I drove in, as I went out, or with the person. We want to pray more for one another because it builds us up. Our last tool that we have is from the Good News Translation, the GNT, it's called. Again, just another version of the Bible whereby we can understand God's words said differently. And that's our hearing and applying of God's word. Hearing and then doing, applying God's word. In Acts 20, verse 32, the author writes these words. And now I command you to the care of God and to the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the blessings that God has for all his people. The message of his grace is God's word. And we know that the Bible says it's not enough just to hear it, you must do it. The hearing and applying of God's word on a regular basis. The hallmark of the early church in Acts chapter 2, they were devoted, it says, to the apostles' teaching. 2 Timothy 3.17 tells us God uses the word to prepare and equip his people to every good work. <clears throat> Important in any family structure, including the church, is knowing what the rules are, knowing what's expected, growing in our knowledge, and then using that knowledge to benefit other people. Everything that we've talked about, all six of these tools, if you will, can only be maximized when we're together. Life on life. Church life can be messy. Church life can be inconvenient at times. But it's the only way to help people grow and the only way for you to ensure your growth. I've said this before and we'll continue to say it. When we're watching each other like this, it's very two-dimensional. Very two-dimensional. True relationships are not built on a flat screen. True relationships are built together. Lives working together, accomplishing goals, sharpening one another. Depth, color comes from our relationships. And I'm looking forward to when we soon get back together. In fact, coming up here in the month of May, on the 17th, we will be asking people to physically come to the church, and we're going to have a question and answer time where we can discuss with one another uh, what you've been learning, how you've been growing, what your struggles have been. What, is it, what will church look like in the, in the future? Uh, there'll be an announcement about this following here, just telling you the time when you can come. We'll sit uh, however is convenient and where you feel uh, where you can sit safely I hate the word, but sit in a uh, place where you don't have to worry about other people and we can talk across the room, but it's a critical that we learn from one another. And then on the 31st of this month, we're going to come together again after our televised service like this. We will come together and we're going to have a prayer and a picnic. Picnic and pray here on the grounds. Everybody can bring their own uh, lunch. We can have families all over the grounds or sit in your car if that's what you want to do. And we can, again, exchange life on life. We can see real people and then get a, a list of prayer concerns for our church and our community as we walk around our 78 acres and just praising God for what he's done for us through these difficult months, but also look towards the future. The way we encourage, the way we build up one another is life on life. You have to do it. 
It's the way that God intended for human relationships to function. So we're looking forward to the future and what he's going to do in and through us here at Grace Church. Father, we love our people. We ask that you continue to work in us. Help us to build one another up, to be more proactive, more aggressive, more loving, more caring in the way that we uh, interact with one another. And by doing so, we will be able to model to the world, those that don't know you, what it means to know you and how to live in real relationships with each other, but also with you. So use us this week to touch somebody's life, we pray, in a practical way to show our love and concern for them, but also to talk to others about you in some capacity. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.